Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Paul, as he wrote the book of Romans, you guys might know a little bit of the history behind it, but he had never visited Rome before as he was writing the book of Romans. He had never spoken to many of the people in Rome. He never spoke to many of the Christian believers there that were in Rome or or even visited many of the churches that were in the surrounding areas. But Paul felt that it was very necessary. He felt that it was very vital for him to write the book of Romans to the Christians that were there living in Rome. And if you guys know a little bit of the history back then, you know that Rome was pretty much the center of the world, right? Rome had pretty much conquered the known world. They had their Roman Empire. And uh, this is where Paul desired to go to, to preach the word of God. He felt like, this is where I need to go. It's kind of like if we had the desire to go to Washington, right? We had the desire to go to preach the gospel to the president. We, ha- we just wanted so badly, if I can just reach the president and just share Jesus Christ with him. Wow, what a difference this country could do. What a, a difference the Lord could do in this country and in this world. Paul had that desire with Rome, and he felt that it was very vital for him to write this letter here to the believers to encourage them to not to be slaves of sin, as he says, leading to death, but to be slaves of righteousness leading to eternal life. And an awesome thing had begun to happen here in the book of Romans as he's writing it around 57 AD. Paul was on his third missionary journey around the Mediterranean Sea there in the the region of Macedonia. He was on his way back to Jerusalem from the city of Corinth, and he had already stopped by a lot of the places that he would be writing his uh, epistles to in the New Testament. He'd already stopped by uh, Ephesus. He'd already stopped by Philippi. He already stopped by Thessalonica, and he was in Corinth at the time on his way again to Jerusalem. He'd been to the churches in Galatia. So he had visited many of these these surrounding areas there. He had been on, on missionary trips for about 10 years now, at this point in his life, traveling from church to church, from synagogue to synagogue, sharing Jesus Christ. And a really neat thing had begun to happen. The disciples, Paul himself, many of the believers, were now in a transition from being disciples of Jesus to now being apostles of Christ, or those that were sent out of Christ. Paul had seen many challenges with the simplicity of the gospel message at this time in his ministry. Man fleeing from its simplicity, by which they're saved with the simplicity of the grace of God, they would either try to combine it with the Jewish religion, trying to set a lot of rules and demands upon the people. You're saved by grace and baptism. You're saved by grace and circumcision. You're saved by grace and right? With man, there's always an and, right? And you still see a lot of churches, a lot of denominations nowadays who try to place those same type of rules upon people. You're saved by Jesus and these things. And Paul saw those same challenges back then here in the book of Romans, or they would go the complete opposite way and they would preach a a watered down, powerless gospel, pretty much. A gospel or religion that was free of any type of boundaries, any type of laws, where anything goes, where anything that make you feel that makes you feel good is okay, right? Anything that you're okay with, hey, we're okay with. Paul sets out to write his greatest work, a lot of people believe, here in the book of Romans. He systematically sets out biblical doctrine where you can just spend a lifetime studying the book of Romans, studying all of its nuggets here in the book, and I encourage you guys to do so. And Paul, as usual, has a very strong desire to be a part of the work that was going on in Rome at that time. As he saw what the Lord was doing in Romans chapter 1 verse 8, Paul thanks the Lord for the church is for the churches that are in Rome because he says their faith is spoken of throughout the world. Imagine that. What a neat thing for that to be said about you, about your church. Hey, I thank God for your church because your faith is spoken of throughout the world. The world knows what your church is doing, what the Lord is doing through your church. And Paul wanted to be a part of that. He heard that many Christians had moved to Rome. And again, this being a really neat thing because no longer was it just Paul and the disciples that were out spreading the gospel and and being apostles now and being sent out, but it was now other believers that they had touched, other believers that they had witnessed to, that had accepted Christ and that were moving on to other parts of the world and they were bringing their Christian faith with them. 
They were bringing their Christian lives with them and they were being a witness there in Rome. And this was really neat. And Paul wanted to be a part of that excitement. I think Paul was a little bit jealous of what the Lord was doing there. He wanted to be a part of it so bad. He saw it and he's like, man, Lord, I want to I wanna, I wanna be a part of that. I want to be used by you. I think Paul had a little bit of jealousy there with him. And I hope that we can be somewhat jealous of the work that is going on around the area, that you could be jealous of the work that God is doing here at this church. As you look out and you see others involved in ministry, you see them involved in the worship, you see them involved in children's ministry, involved in sound, involved in ushering, you say, man, Lord, I want you to use me like that. I want to be used by you. I I just want to be that empty vessel, Lord, poured out and just filled with your glory. Not so that we can get the glory, of course, so that because we're entitled in any way, but just so that we can be used by the Lord. And I hope that the same thing can be said about our church, that as we look out at other churches around the world, around this country, that we say, man, Lord, what are you doing over there? What is so different about this church? How are you using them in this area? How can we be used by you in that area here in Mariloma, here in Riverside? Paul says in chapter 6, verse 1, He says, what shall we say then? What shall we say then? Implying that chapter 6 is a continuation from chapter 5 or from the previous topic here. For the first five chapters, Paul was pretty much doing what he loved to do as he traveled on his missionary journeys, as he traveled throughout the synagogues and throughout Macedonia and the regions there. He, He was preaching the gospel pretty much for the first five chapters. He was setting up the gospel message. And in verse 8, he comes pretty much to the pivot point of his message. And he says, he says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How beautiful that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Isn't that an awesome thing if you truly think about it? While we were still sinners, God died for us. Thank God that he didn't wait until we became righteous. I'm going to wait for you guys. I'm going to wait till you guys get it all together. Then I'm going to die for you. Then I'm going to go ahead and do the work and allow you to be saved. None of us would be here today, right? I know I wouldn't be here. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, we were still lost. And God said, I'm going to still do that work on the cross. Thank God that he didn't wait for us. Paul asked the question again in chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So he pretty much says, so to the church in Rome again, so you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've made a commitment to God. You raised your hand at the altar call. You went to the last crusade. You know, you were there a part of the, the, the uh, men and women that came forward with Peter's message, message there in the book of Acts. What now? What do we do now? And as he finishes up the gospel message in chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, read along with me. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, so even so, grace might, uh, might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. As the law was established, the offense towards God, the sin towards God abounded even more. It increased, right? Without a speeding limit, there is no such thing as speeding, right? Some of us would enjoy that. Yeah, let's just get rid of all, all speeding limits, right? We can go as fast as we want. Before there was a speeding limit, there was no such thing as speeding, right? But now that the law has established 65 to be the speed limit, I think it's 65, right? Some areas 75. But now as 65 is a speed limit, going 80 is now an offense, right? Where 80 before was not an offense. And going 100 is considered reckless driving. So... The idea is, again, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. If I'm forgiven for going 100, it shows the grace of God that much more than if I'm forgiven for only going 80, for only going 75. So there's some truth 
to this statement, sin increased tremendously since the law was established. We offended God. Our offense towards God just increased. And in that increase, Paul says that the grace of God has abounded even so much more, that it has increased even so much more. Verse 15 says, What then? Shall we, shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So the grace of God is a subject that men and women love even there in the time of Paul, in the time of Christ, love to be foolish about, love to be ignorant about. We think that the more that we sin, that it's okay because the more grace is going to abound and we love to be ignorant about God's grace. Losing my notes here, sorry, bear with me. Paul asks the question again, shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Sometimes when we read the word of God, we we forget the relevance of the word of God. The Lord was just hitting me this morning. Don't ever think that the word of God is not relevant for today in our lives. So many people still having that same question that Paul brought to the church in, in, uh, in Rome there. Should we sin more because of God's grace? How many people here nowadays still believing the same thing? Well, I can just, you know, go off and do my own thing. I can uh, come forward on Sunday. I can be a part of the altar call. I can go uh, ask for God's forgiveness, be a part of God's grace, and I can go off on Monday and live the same life. And when in reality, what are we doing? We're asking the same question. Can we just go and just, you know, uh, allow God's grace to abound because uh, 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 because of the grace that God has given us? The grace of God, a subject that men and women love to just be ignorant about. Some people are still asking the same question today. They come to church. They want to be a part of everything. They want to be a part of the afterglows. They want to be a part of of, uh, of what the Lord is doing. That's where the world has has um, came up with the term come to Jesus experience, right? Oh, they had a come to Jesus experience. And really it's because of people coming to Christ and then still going home and living the same life that they lived before they accepted Christ. And we think, oh, how great God is. How awesome God is. When in reality, it's not showing God's grace and his greatness But in reality, it's showing the heart of man, the disobedient heart of man. Verse 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Whoever you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slave. Some of you guys know that a few months ago, me and my wife had a child a little golden retriever named Shiloh and a beautiful little golden retriever. And uh, the other day, you know, I'm sitting at home and, and she goes up to the slider door to the glass and she, she scratches on the, the glass because she wants to get out, you know, and go outside. And so I get up and I go open the door for her so she can go out. And I think, man, I got this dog trained good. Four months old only, you know, man, she's doing real. Okay, we got this. We got this girl trained. She's obedient. And then, you know, five minutes later, she comes back up to the slider door, and she scratches again from the outside, and I go up and open the door for her so she can come back in. All right, yeah, she, she knows, you know. Less than a minute later, she goes back up to the glass again. So there I go, I get up, and I go open the door for her again, and I let her out. and I start to think, wait a second here. Who's being obedient to who? <laughs> she scratches the door. I get up to go open the door for her. When she's hungry, I get up to go feed her and get her food. When she's thirsty, I get the water for her. I clean her, you know, her, her bowls for her. Who's serving who here? You know, and a lot of times, you know, that's how it is with the world. We think that we have the world or this certain thing of the world, this certain, you know, aspect of the world trained in our lives that it's being obedient to us. Oh, I, I got this under control. And what happens is, in reality, is that it starts to train us. 
and we end up becoming the servant of it. Paul says, to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slave. So he says that everyone is a slave. All are slaves. He says, whatever thing you obey, you are that one's slaves. It's whatever you present yourself to. That we actually present ourselves to these things. It's a willful decision of ourselves, not a slave that's forced God doesn't force us to follow him. God doesn't doesn't force us to be obedient to him. He gives us that free will. And he honors that free will in our life. To choose him or not to choose him. It starts out with the presentation. The Greek word presentation is used elsewhere, uh, meaning to stand by or to yield to. So a lot of times we present ourselves to the things of the world. We stand by it. We get a little closer to it. We even go as far as yielding to it, right? When it comes up, we even stop for it. Oh, you know, I want to, you know, we're stopping for the things of the world. And then eventually what it turns into is it turns into full-on slavery. Paul says that we're slaves to whatever things we choose to obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So it's not whatever thing we claim to be slaves to. It's not whatever we, you know, we can't speak it into reality. Oh, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. We can't just speak it into reality. He says, it's whatever things you obey. It's by our actions. Salvation is not shown through a prayer, right? It's not shown through the raising of the hand, but it's shown through the obedience to Christ. It's not obtained through the obedience of Christ, but it's shown through the obedience to Christ. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15 and 16, Paul encourages Timothy that it's all about the word of God. We don't know what obedience unto righteousness is. We don't know what obedience to God is without the word of God. How can we claim, how can we profess to say that, yeah, we want to be obedient to God. We're striving, we're working to be obedient to God. Without his word, without reading and studying the scriptures. Paul says in, in 2 Timothy 3.15, he's uh, to telling Timothy, he says, From childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I would encourage you guys Don't read the Bible, study the Bible. Too many times I think we we fight so hard to just read the Bible. Oh, if I could just read the Bible. Okay, I'm gonna read five verses today. All right, I, I got through my five verses, I'm done for the day. And we think we've completed something, you know, we check it off the list. When in reality, we should be studying the Bible. We should be searching the scriptures We should be opening it up and finding out about the book of Romans, who it was written to, who this guy Paul was. We should be studying the word of God. I think that that this right here is the church's Achilles heel. It's the church's Achilles heel. It's It's our deadly weakness in spite of overall strength. We can act as if we are so strong. We can be such a large church even. We can be strong in the Lord. And then what happens is we don't even know the word of God. And it's our, our Achilles heel. One, one uh, blow to it and there we go. We're down. Because we don't know scriptures. You cannot serve two masters. You have to be obedient to one. You'll love one and you'll hate the other. Verse 17 through 19 says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. But I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. He says, but God be thanked. Thank God for our salvation. Again, that he died for us on the cross before we were righteous, while we were yet sinners. Nothing in ourselves. Who do we thank? We thank God. Thank God he also says that you accepted the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. He says, thank God that you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine 
that has delivered you. So in accepting Jesus, he says that you've automatically became slaves of sin, that you've automatically been delivered from sin and you've, became, you've become slaves, uh, I'm sorry, not slaves of sin, slaves of righteousness. We've been set free from being slaves of sin and now become slaves of righteousness. Paul says, just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, so he says, man, you were good at sinning. You were good at it, man. You presented your whole body. No one was better than sinning than you. You guys were great. The whole body. You, didn't, you talked the talk. You walked the walk. You didn't let anyone hold you back. You proved it. But he says, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. He says, now just as you went 110% for the world, just as you went all out to party and have a good time for the world and for yourself, he says, go all out for Jesus Christ now. Go all out for God 110%. Don't let anyone hold you back for the Lord. With your whole body, your hands to work, your feet to walk, your mouth to speak. Use your, all of your members, he says, for the Lord. All we have to do is present our members to the Lord. All we have to do is to present ourselves to God. We just have to stand by. We just have to yield to the Lord. We present them to the Lord, and the Lord will be faithful to use us. Verse 20 says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. He says you were free in regard to righteousness. It's interesting how before we were slaves of righteousness, as Paul says, that we were not ashamed of sin. We weren't ashamed of sin, were we? We flaunted sin. We were proud of it, you know? Go watch a filthy movie, cuss up a storm. No one's going to judge me. The only scripture we knew was judge not, least you be judged. Cheated on my taxes, saved a bunch of money, and we're bragging about it, you know? Lying. Lying to the insurance guy. Whatever we could do to get away with anything. Oh, man, we were proud of it. We were unashamed. There was no shame in it. Why? Because Paul says that we were free from righteousness. We were free from righteousness. We didn't even know what righteousness was. There was no righteousness even in us. Even our good works were as filthy rags. There was two guys working in a city. One guy would dig a hole, and he would dig, 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 and this other guy would come behind him, and he would fill the hole back up. He would just fill, fill, fill. So they were going along one day, and this guy, the guy comes up, and he digs, 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 and his guy comes behind him, and he just fills, fills, fills. This man watching them and how hard they're working goes up to them, and he says, hey, you know, I appreciate your hard work, but um, can I just ask you what you guys are doing? One of you guys comes up, and you just dig, 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 and the other guy comes behind you, and he just fills, fills, fills. And the whole digger replied, oh, yeah, I know it must look funny, but, you know, as I'm digging, 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 and this other guy is filling, 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 he says, but the guy who plants trees is sick today. That's why I'm not a comedian, see? That's why I'm a pastor. But the analogy stands true. You'll laugh later at home and then text me. The analogy stands true. I really just like the, I didn't think it was funny either. I like the analogy behind it. So many times we dig, 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 right? We're working. We're working so hard. We're putting all the time and effort into working, especially in the world, apart from righteousness. We're filling, filling, filling. And yet the fruit that should be coming from our labor is non-existent. It's not even there. It's not even possible to have fruit without a tree, is it? Just as it's not even possible to have fruit without Christ. It's not possible to have eternity without Jesus. Impossible. We were free from righteousness. He says, for the end of those things is death. The end of those things is death. Wow. Wow, when you can come to the realization that everything that I am, everything that I am, everything that I was unashamed of in the world is coming to death. It's all going to die. It's all going to to perish. There's 
hopelessness in myself apart from the Lord. Nothing, nothing that we worked for before Christ produced any fruit. My end will still always be death when my, diso- when my obedience is to the world. Verse 22 says, but now, but now having been set free, thank God that there's a but, right? Yeah, all these things, all these things that you were is leading to death. It's all going to perish. It's all going to die. And then Paul throws in there, but now, thank God for that, but now. It says, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life in the midst of the storm in the midst of hopelessness and death in the disobedience to God and in the obedience to the world Paul says there we stand everlasting life eternal life through the Lord righteous and holy he says the Lord wraps us in his righteousness that's how God sees us No longer seeing us in that unashamed sin that we once were. No longer seeing us in that sin, in that filth, in that death, that corrupted body. But he now sees us in incorruption, in righteousness. Verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin, that payment that we had, all that digging, 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 all that feeling, feeling, feeling. All the work that we did toiling over this world. Toiling for our own gain. And yet the wages at the end of the day, that paycheck that we get, all it's going to say is death on it. It's going to say death. That's it. He says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Why can't men get it right? Why can't man understand the grace of God, the gift of God? You have one side that is complete liberalism. One side that that says that we can do all things, that we can love all things, that we can enjoy all things. Western culture, right? You have the other side that is complete legalism. That takes away man's freedom. That causes man to be in submission. That has physical punishment even for disobedience. Eastern culture. No balance. You either take all of man's freedoms away and you force him into submission or man gets his freedoms and he squanders it. He throws it away. He tramples on it. The gift of God is eternal life. There's nothing that we have to do to earn this gift from God. That is amazing. There is a free gift, this eternal life. When we obtain that eternal life through grace, it's shown through obedience to God. It's not obtained through obedience to God, but it is shown through obedience to the Lord. Don't squander your freedoms. My encouragement to you guys this morning is that you would live in righteousness. You've obtained that eternal life from God. You've obtained that free gift from the Lord. And as Paul encouraged the church here in the book of Romans to get out of the obedience to the world, He said, you already became slaves of righteousness. You already became slaves of the Lord when you accepted the Lord. Now he encourages them to just live in it. Just enjoy it. Just serve the Lord. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound, Paul said? Certainly not. Let's just serve the Lord, he says. Anytime the question is, shall we continue in sin? Should we sin a little more here? Realize that the answer is probably no. You know, whenever that question is asked and how simple we think that question is, yet how relevant it is still today. That we want to grab all the grace from the Lord. We want to grab all the gifts from God. And yet we don't want to have the obedience to the Lord at times. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, he said that the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He said, the grace of God is exceedingly abundant. Here's Paul. Here's a man that you guys know lived according. He said that he lived according to the strictest sect of the Jewish religion. He followed every law that the Jewish law could throw at him. 
He tried a works-based relationship with God. He worked so hard to know God. And in the end, all he could say is that he was the chief of sinners. Here's a man that if you looked at Paul, you said, man, if anyone's going to heaven, Paul, it's this guy. It's you. And yet Paul sits back and he says, dude, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm nothing. What I'm leading to is death. There was nothing in his life that was good. There was nothing in Paul's life that could reconcile him to the Lord, that could restore his relationship to God. And what did God have to do? He had to blind him. He had to blind him so that Paul could see. We're going to have the worship team come back up and, and do a song. And I just want to encourage you guys in your relationship with the Lord. I know most of you guys. I know probably all you guys. We all know each other. We all know the relationship that we have with the Lord. We all know that hopefully, prayerfully, we've accepted Jesus Christ into our lives. And if you haven't, I would encourage you today to come up after the worship and ask us how you can accept the Lord into your life as your personal Lord and Savior, how He can become King and reign in your life. But for most of us, having accepted the Lord already, I would encourage you guys, again, to enjoy and to live in the obedience to the Lord. That we would be slaves of righteousness. God said we already became slaves of righteousness. Don't fight against what the Lord has already made you. Just go with it. Enjoy it. Love it.